Hello and welcome everyone um, to another month's Queensland AI Meetup. Um, has been a little while, but I hope you're all doing well. It's a shame we can't meet up in person, obviously. Uh, it is always a highlight, but this will do for now. Um, before we do get tonight to tonight's talk, uh, we'd like to share a couple of points with you all. Uh, now, when signing up for this month's meetup, you might have actually noticed mentions of a partnership between Queensland AI, the meetup, and the newly formed Queensland AI Hub. Uh, over, the last, over the last year or two, um, Advanced Queensland um, has been developing this new initiative, the Queensland AI Hub, to help spur the growth of, of machine learning, robotics, and AI in the state. Uh, and of course, that, that will be based here in Brisbane. Now, the Queensland AI Hub is now up and running. Uh, and tonight we'd like to announce a partnership between the Meetup and the Hub. So what does that mean? Well, looking ahead, things won't really change too much for the Meetup. We'll still continue to be independent and run these community events. Um, the goal, of course, to bring interesting guests, share their stories and interesting projects with all of us. However, uh, in order to help the organizing team of the meetup focus on bringing the best guests and topics to everyone. The Queensland AI Hub will be giving assistance with the planning and organizing of the events. Um, and when we do go back to in-person meetups, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, they will be assisting with broadcasting our meetups to those still at home and unable to make it in person. Uh, we had previously done a little bit of this, but uh, we'll be doing it uh, properly a little bit better. Uh, a number of you expressed that that is something you'd be interested in. So we will be looking to do that moving forward. Um, a little bit about the hub. Note that while they will be assisting us, the, the AI hub is actually going to be, bring a lot of events and a lot to the local community. Um, they'll be broadcasting a large number of events each month. Um, if you go over to their website, you can have a look at a number of them. But for example, uh, last month, or about four to six weeks ago, there was a medical uh, hackathon or datathon. Some of you may have attended that. Um, I think there were about 100 attendees and it was quite successful. A lot of people met there. Um, next week, there's a monthly straight out of Queensland series. Uh, that will hear from a local AI company using satellite and ground-based sensor data combined with deep, deep uh, and machine learning software for early wildfire detection. Um, and then in the coming weeks, there'll also be some more events from other groups, such as Young Women Leaders in AI. Uh, there'll be talks on other topics related to the field, things like soft skills, other interesting and important skills that anyone involved in the industry um, will, will bring value. Um, and really the goal of the hub is to help local businesses and practitioners succeed. Um, so make sure that you're signed up to the mailing list to hear about those events and initiatives, or just check out the website and you can see a list of those. Um, on this note, um, the, the hub, given that it's, you know, just started, uh, we, they want to understand a little bit more about the local scene. Um, they're actually conducting a survey to get to know the community a little bit better, understand how we all fit into it. And, um, you know, for example, if you're a local company or startup, whether you work in the industry or whether you're just a supporter studying, etc., cetera, um, it's quite short. And Sonia from the AI Hub will be posting it right about now in the chat. Um, there's many Sonias in here, but trust me, the, the first link you see is probably the right one. Um, so please click that link. Um, it's a pretty short survey. I think it's only a few questions and that'll actually help them create better events uh, for everyone. So that's enough announcements for now. Um, let's get on with the meetup. So tonight we welcome Andrew Job. Now, Andrew is the CEO of PlotLogic. Uh, PlotLogic is a local Brisbane startup focused on using uh, computer vision and machine learning to classify and categorize all online sites. Um, there's a lot more to it, which Andrew will get into, but in just four years, they've grown very quickly. Um, they found really good traction with some of Australia's largest uh, mining companies, and they've raised large rounds of capital um, in funding from some top venture capital firms in Silicon Valley and the US and globally, actually. Um, Andrew is going to be sharing a bit about their journey um, and following the talk, we will have some time for questions. If you do have questions, please share them in the chat. And once Andrew is finished with his talk, uh, we'll go through some of them and he can answer those. Um, so Andrew, take it away. Oh, fantastic, thanks for the introduction. And it's lovely to be able to talk to the 
Brisbane, <coughs> excuse me, Queensland AI community. Uh, I think you should just want to confirm before I get going that you can see the screen okay and it's uh, the, the presentation's coming through nice and clear. It is for me, I think it is for everyone else. Excellent, all right. Um, yeah, so I got a, 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 a presentation which is really um, as, as described, um, covering off a few key areas. Um, really try to break it down to around about 40 minutes um, and then opportunity for questions. Uh, normally I'd take lots of questions along the way, but obviously with this type of forum that makes it kind of, kind of difficult. So um, as we suggested up front, you know, feel free to, to drop lots of questions into the, into the Q and A um, area and I'll, I'll endeavor to answer them as best I can. Um, so the presentation's really broken into uh, two key parts. The first is really to talk a little bit about our vision and you know, why we're here and a little bit about our company, how we've grown. Um, and we think that's important because it tells a story about how um, AI-based companies here in Brisbane uh, can actually engage on a global scale and get really good international traction both from an investor point of view and also from a client point of view. And there's some really clever people here, um, not just in, in Brisbane and in Queensland, but in, in the Australian community that have got a huge amount that can contribute on some of the world's big um, AI challenges. Um, so talk a little bit about that and then dive more in for the technical people, a little bit our, about our actual technology itself, um, how the technology works and more specifically how um, we're using AI um, and, and, and really sort of machine learning and, and uh, massive data processing, uh, both on the edge and in the cloud to solve some of these really big problems. Um, so a little bit, hopefully for everybody, if there's people that have got more of a, a technical bent and don't really care about the journey, then you might just sort of have to hold fire for 10 or 15 minutes and vice, vice versa, if you're really interested in the, the story of how we've got to here and what we're doing. Um, then the first part will be most interesting and the second bit might, your eyes might glaze over, but I'll try to pitch it as best I can for a diverse, uh, diverse audience. So just to, I guess, um, start off, you know, really wanted to talk about um, this idea that we call, I don't know if we came up with it or I came up with it or somebody came up with it before me, I can't really find it well referenced anywhere in literature but this idea of what I call the natural resources paradox. And it's really quite a simple notion and lots of people talk about it, but in lots of different ways. And, and that is that everybody that you speak to really thinks of two often quite competing um, ideas that need to be held in parallel. Firstly, um, importantly, everybody agrees as a general rule that everyone should have a high quality of life and having a high quality of life often enables, often means rather that you need to have all those elements that go with a modern lifestyle. For example, decent hospitals, decent healthcare, education, infrastructure and the like. And to do that, you need natural resources. You need uh, mined commodities or soft commodities in order to be able to provide all those, all those elements that go into a modern functioning society that allows people to have not just good quality of life, but longevity of life as well. And then on the same account, um, if you talk to people about, you know, this idea of, 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 of one planet, you know, the, the, the ABC show about, you know, planet A, um, there's lots of things uh, very commonly understood that, you know, whenever we take uh, diminishing resources out of, our, out, of our, out of our planet, they're essentially irreplaceable. There's opportunities to recycle and the like, but ultimately, whenever we do damage to the planet, uh, in many cases, it's irreversible, or if it's not irreversible, it takes a very long time to, to recover that. So on balance, people want this idea of a high quality of life and also not destroying the planet. And we see this as being a, what we call the natural resources paradox, because ultimately you, the traditional way is to be uh, split between two opposing ideas. And the first one being that you produce less. So we say, okay, we're not gonna do any more um, damage the environment, we're going to limit farming, we're going to limit agriculture, we're going to limit um, the amount of resources that are pulled out of the ground from a mining point of view, which is where, where we're focusing our efforts. Uh, but of course, with that means you limit growth. And, and the limiting of growth is not just an immediate 
uh, economic consequence like we're seeing at the moment with the, the pandemic that's playing out, but also this long-term structural ramifications of that that potentially have not just immediate, medium term, but intergenerational impacts. The second, the second approach is to say, well, let's just produce as much as anybody can possibly take, you know, whether that's from, from protein or through um, the, the production of, of mined commodities, you know, bauxite, iron ore, uh, copper, you name know, it, just produce as much as it can possibly be reduced um, so that everybody from sub-Saharan Africa to Mongolia to Australia can expect and have a very high quality of life. And of course, with that um, comes the, the ensuing damage. So the idea that we, we are challenging ourselves on, um, and it's a big idea, is how do we produce more? How do we get all these things that we need, but at the same account do less damage along the way? And this is where we've come up with this idea of delivering the future of natural resources and using uh, advanced sensor technology and AI at the core of enabling fully autonomous and integrated mining operations that really um, are enabled by precise grade control that allow us to essentially deliver a lot more um, output for a lot less input. So we're getting um, you know, more, more resources for less uh, carbon input. We're getting more resources for less energy input. We're doing that with less destruction to the environment. So that's a, a reasonably hefty challenge, but I've come at this from a background of, of working in the industry for a long period of time and have been building up a team that is building some capability that's delivering some fantastic results in this space. So that's, I guess, the big, the big challenge that we're, we're working on. Um, as was mentioned up front, we started the company back in 2016. Uh, so it was a bit of a, a, a long journey for the first few years. Um, prior to 2016, I was working in, in the mining industry. Um, I was running mining operations for Anglo-American. Previous to that, I worked for a company called Glencore and before that for a company called Rio Tinto. So reasonably common. Uh, household names, if you're familiar with the mining industry, and in, generally in senior operational uh, general manager type roles. 2016 got to a point where we made the call to say, um, you know, we, we'd identified, and I say we, it was essentially myself um, and, and a few of my key uh, mentors and advisors and, and, and supporters had been talking about some ideas about how we could really do things structurally quite differently in the mining industry and that the best way to bring about that change was to do it through a new company, as opposed to trying to make those very slow piecemeal changes inside these very, very large, uh, cumbersome, uh, often cumbersome organisations that, that, that uh, exist at the moment. So made a call to break out on my own and form a company, um, had a research partnership with the Smart Machines Group here at the University of Queensland. Um, the University of Queensland Smart Machines Group is one of, if not the leading um, organisation for mining field robotics uh, globally. So there's essentially two or three uh, research institutes around the entire planet that are really at the leading edge of uh, mining automation and mining efficiency. Uh, University of Sydney, Australian Centre of Field Robotics is one. University of Queensland Smart Machines Group under Professor Ross Macri is another. Um, and we, we partnered with, with the University of Queensland because of that capability. So really strong capability here in Brisbane, uh, specifically around mining technology and mining automation, which we, we uh, tapped into quite early. Um, I bootstrapped the company with my partner, uh, Philip R. Pip, for the first few years. Um, got some really good traction. We got a research agreement with the Mineral Research Institute of Western Australia to do some early work uh, with a couple of companies called Anglo Gold Ashanti, another one called City Pacific Mining. Um, off the back of that, we got some really good traction around work that we were doing. And the idea at that particular point in time was to look purely at how we could uh, create an autonomous mining shovel. And as part of that uh, idea, um, we started with, the, with a rudimentary concept of uh, MVP and our MVP to do the research de-risking of the fitment to a shovel was to fit the technology to the back of a light vehicle, allowed us to go out to mine sites, collect the data that we needed um, in order to inform the research for the later stage uh, effort. Um, but we found that when we went out there and do, did this uh, basic, uh, or not basic, but early stage research, that people were saying to us, hey, if we could just have this system mounted to a light vehicle, we'd be willing to buy it right now because we can see a lot of application for that. So we decided to accelerate the commercialization um, bringing about the light vehicle system into something that could be more 
uh, easily um, operated uh, across the mining industry, we're still having the view of automating the, the entire mining system. So started with that and, and, and as a result, just worked out that bootstrapping the company would only get us so far. Um, so then made a decision to go to uh, seek uh, investors. Uh, we focused strongly on North America. Um, that was mostly based on some early uh, testing I did with the venture capital community here in Australia. There wasn't a strong appetite for companies that were at that particular point of time uh, in what was and still is very deep tech. So we, we're very research intensive uh, uh, business that, that's doing some pretty heavy lifting in terms of some of the algorithms, robotics, automation and, and integration of massive data sets in real time. So a real, you know, quite a, quite a um, classic definition of a deep tech company. Wasn't a lot of appetite for that in the venture capital community in Australia from our early testing. And also wasn't a lot of appetite in Australia for companies that were pre-revenue and we essentially were pre-revenue um, at that point of time. So um, made a decision to go and uh, focus on the North America investment community. And basically it was flying backwards and forwards to, to the US every eight weeks over the course of about uh, nine or 10 months. And then um, through a series of, of processes, uh, got some really good investment traction from some of the world's um, leading companies for deep tech AI companies. So we got investment from Beidou Ventures, um, Data Collective, DCV, DCVC, uh, VC and, and Grids Capital. And when we raised our angel rounds, we've only done one round of fundraising. We ended up being quite significantly oversubscribed, um, had to knock back some investors because the round was, was so oversubscribed and in a position where we're looking at doing our next raise early to accelerate again. Um, we've now got some early clients on board with uh, BHP, um, Anglo Gold, um, Ashanti, um, and some other other clients that, that cover off different different regions and different commodities. And throughout the last essentially six months, we've been focusing on building out the team. So it started with myself um, and Pip, and then we put on uh, two postdoc uh, heavy hitters, one in the sensor space, a guy called Dr. Nick Edgar, who spent 30 odd years developing this type of sensor technology, mostly for NASA and US military. And then Dr. Richard Murphy, who's developed um, a, lot, a very deep understanding of um, hyperspectral geological uh, mapping algorithms and is world expert in that space. Uh, they were the first two recruits and then um, have been building out software engineers, uh, data science team um, and other mechatronics mechanical engineers to build out our, our stack. And over the next six months, we're planning on, on, um, on extending that team further. Um, so uh, as I said, we've got some expertise in different areas. Um, a couple of our big strengths is in, is in um, uh, spectral geology, which is a quite a nuanced field. And, and for people that um, like a really meaty AI challenge, hyperspectral um, sensing with the way that we're doing it is, is extraordinarily meaty. Um, we do a typical scan of a, of a mining dig face. We might collect somewhere between 10 and, and 20 gigabytes worth of raw data, um, which is um, 464 channels. So a typical RGB scan will have three channels. We'll go 464 channels for every single pixel. And then we've got to go through a whole, whole stack of, um, of, of algorithms and processes to do pre-processing and then and obviously the processing after that. Um, so we've got some good expertise in that area and also from the hardware sensor and mining robotics point of view and we're also building out that that, that capability and most recently we've been building out our, our software development team as we operationalize and commercialize uh, the technology that up until this year was was largely being um, being written and developed by myself and a, and a couple of people. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the last slide, our team's are around about 15 people at the moment as a, as a headcount. Um, we, we're aiming to double our team over the next few months so that by December, uh, we'll be up over 30 people. And our next recruitment focus areas is continuing to expand the software engineering capability um, and then data engineering and data science is really the big big area that we're, we're building out extra, um, extra capacity at, at this point of time. So we've got some really exciting projects um, both in terms of some quite research inten intensive parts of the AI stream, but also in the, in the commercialization and then converting some of these research intensive 
bodies of work into things that can be then productized and rolled out into industry. Um, we, we have been getting some really good traction, a little bit repetitive and, uh, and a little bit self-promoting, but you know, we, up until now, um, we, we have made um, no effort whatsoever to, to do any form of marketing or advertising. We've got a LinkedIn page, which um, our, our people and culture guys started you know, doing some LinkedIn posts, which is great. Uh, but aside from that, we've really had uh, um, no marketing effort or, or outbound work. And um, we've, we've been in a position where we're having lots of companies approach us quite regularly um, out, out of the blue that have heard of what we're doing um, and are interested in engaging with us in developing different partnerships and also straight to productization of, of what we're doing. So had, um, um, you know, companies, for example, like De Beers from South Africa, Anglo-American in the South American operations, Severstil in, in Russia, Anglo God Ashanti in, in uh, Colombia, Vale, Brazil, um, and then Australian operations as well that have literally through word of mouth heard about what we've been doing and have been really excited to to um, to come and talk to us about partnership opportunities. So we're in a <clears throat> in a fortunate position where um, you know we we we're only constrained by our own ability to accelerate and grow at this at this point in time. And in terms of the, the broader vision, so I think this is important because the way that we are, are constructing this business is not to say, hey, we've got this really cool bit of, um, of, of um, data processing, machine learning, AI, we've got this really cool sensor, um, and, and then just going and deploying that on a bunch of sites. But we started the business um, from, from day zero with this broad vision in mind. And that's really has been really important for us, both in terms of you know, gaining investors, so people that want to um, have a have a parallel view as us, or a aligned view and aligned vision that then want to invest in what we're doing. Um, but also, it helps keeping us guided because we're still very much a, um, a, a um, an early stage pre commercialized company, and we've got you know literally hundreds and thousands of decisions that we're making. You know, every every month, every day, month, week and quarter. And so by having a very clear vision about where we're taking things, it provides us with a, a framework on, on how we can actually make decisions and which way we take um, the, the business and which way we, we, we focus our energies on research or through um, operationalization of different, different uh, components. So uh, we started with this, <coughs> excuse me, this idea of having a, a sensor that could be fitted to a shovel um, and then use that to actually provide real-time characterization of the ore. That's really important because one of the biggest inefficiencies in mining is <clears throat> when you start a mine, you'll drill some holes in the ground um, that are often spaced, you know, 50, 100 metres apart, literally football fields apart. You'll collect from that some, some drill, drill cord information and that drill core information you then use to build a geological model. <clears throat> so there's a whole bunch of uh, geostatistical work that goes into you know, doing a, a, a geological model based on those very sparse data points. And that works reasonably well when you're trying to determine at a very coarse level, you know, plus or minus 10% for a bankable feasibility study, you know, exactly how much ore is in the ground. But within that, that uh, very broad, um, general characterization of the, that resource, when you actually go to start mining, the localized variation can be quite significant. And at the moment, there's no real way of actually controlling down to meter by meter or bucket by bucket that localized variation because of the way that the technology has been evolved and there's been a, a significant gap there for some time. Rio Tinto and BHP, both uh, prior to us, um, were developing this technology themselves. They saw also the huge opportunity in, in having that very granular understanding of the, the resource as they're mining it, that they can feed into process optimization. They can make sure that waste goes to the waste dump and all goes to the stockpile and the like. Um, and uh, we, we've been able to quite quickly accelerate past them to the point now where uh, BHP is, is partnered with us and we have a contract in place with BHP. They've stopped their own internal programs have seen that we've accelerated quicker. Uh, and Rio Tinto was partnered with the University of Sydney Australian Centre of Field Robotics and their lead researcher, Dr. Richard Murphy, is now one of our employees. So, so they're also uh, a little bit um, 
uh, stalled out in that regard, but there's a whole bunch of other people now over the last couple of years since we started this company that are also um, staking a claim, so to speak, in terms of you know being able to provide this type of technology. So <clears throat> the call is always at, at uh, real-time shovel scanning um, and, the, and the technology that we selected, which is hyperspectral combined, combined with LiDAR, fit in the use case. So we came at this from a from a from an opportunity um, and, a, and a challenge in the industry, as opposed to saying we've got this technology, where can we plug it in? Um, and through that, those set of use cases and requirements, that's how we arrived at the, the system that we ended up building out. Um, and then from there, um, you know, there's there's opportunities to expand that out both upstream into an exploration phase. Um, and I heard here um, uh, Michael mentioned before about companies doing satellite remote sensing for early detection of fire. There's similar technology um, applications for the, the equipment that we use or the sensors that we use to support rapid exploration. And it's been developed quite significantly over the last 30 years, but we also see that as being an opportunity for us in some of the ways that we're approaching, uh, approaching the opportunity. Um, we've done prototype testing with, with UAV configuration that fits with certain use cases. We're currently doing prototype testing with a down the hole configuration that allows us to penetrate further and further into rock mass. Um, and then over the conveyor configurations to support blend optimization. And we're in the process of also um, um, going underground and we're, we're, we're about to do our first underground deployment in the next, next month or so. So the, the core technology itself, um, as I mentioned, there's a, this is one of the, on the left, you can see one of the very early uh, prototypes that we took out to an iron ore mine. Uh, this particular one uh, was mounted on the back of a light vehicle. Um, essentially, we use, uh, as I said, um, the, the sensing technology, which is hyperspectral imaging in combination with LIDAR and then a whole bunch of, of uh, data processing in order to make determinations, you know, literally at a centimetre scale as to the, the boundaries of those different material types. And then we can use that to inform um, optimization of mining schedules and, and the like. Um, the, we use also uh, GNSs to um, to provide you know quite accurate spatial maps, so we can actually correlate that back to an underlying geological model, and then help build out the geological model further with what we're doing. A little bit about how you know the technology actually works at a, at a quite a I guess a, a fundamental level. Um, the, the in essence, what we're doing is exploiting the interaction of light with matter. So. Um, Every, every material that's known to, 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 to man has a, um, a characteristic interaction of how that material interacts with, with light. Um, in an open cut mine, we just use natural light, so light from the sun, it pummels the, the rock face, and then um, based on that interaction, we then um, receive back a signal. So it's the same in, in that very um, uh, basic level, like a normal uh, human eye or RGB photo where you can tell green from blue or red based on the on the response um, of of light interacting with that particular surface. We extend that out beyond the visible part of the spectrum. So the visible spectrum is 400 to 700, 800 nanometers. Um, but essentially, that's the visible part of the light spectrum that, that we can see with our normal eyes. We extend out into the um, near infrared and short wave infrared part of the light spectrum because there's some really interesting interactions of light with 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 uh, <coughs> minerals in that part of the spectrum that obviously you can't see with human eye. So you can look at a, a rock face and it may all look grey and it may all look identical, but when you actually start looking in other parts of the spectrum, you can see different responses. And based on those responses, you can then make determinations about um, the underlying material characteristics. So in this particular image it's one of our very early scans that we did this is going back uh, 18 months ago now and the image in the top left has been irradiated with natural light uh, we then have a sensor breaks it up into its component wavelengths over that particular target range um, and we also do scanning with with uh, lidar to build up a spatial map um, and in this particular um, classification process what we're seeking to do is use a, a technique called automated feature extraction uh, which essentially um, provides uh, a little bit like a uh, a little bit like a kernel in a convolution, where you where you're um, putting that 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 frame over a, over a section of of a spectral signature, and then using that to identify 
um, particular absorption features that might be characteristic for, for that material. And then once you identify those characteristic um, absorption features, that you can then do um, some classification to split out different zones based on those groupings of different um, absorption features that you, you observe. So it was a pretty early application for us. Um, interestingly, this particular dig face um, had zone of of um, of, good, of bad material interlaying into the into the middle of the the, the the ore mass, and we were able to identify that purely without any any pre training or or or, or label data sets, just from using some some um, automated processes. Um, a big part of what, of what we have to do in order to commercialise is to take the technology and make it usable for people. So most um, people that work in this field, um, purely at the spectral geology point of view, um, will have a, a PhD or, or, or something similar. Um, and have spent many, many years working out, you know, how these different interactions work. The traditional approach is you'll con conduct a hyperspectral scan of a face. It won't have LIDAR attached to it. We then collect that raw data. You might take several days to process that raw data and convert it into um, a, a set of um, response signatures. Then once you've got those relative response signatures, you then do a whole bunch more processing in order to work out what you think is going on with that interface. So quite a, quite a time consuming process, but it has evolved because it has been so uh, nuanced and such a specialized field. But we found that to get good market traction, we need to be able to provide at least a framework of tools that people can use to visualize what's going on um, to, to be able to have that full impact. So you can see, <coughs> excuse me, this is a this is an example of a of a of a very rough visualizer that we we did uh, ignore the, the logos, but we're doing this as a demo for a, for another company as to how they had a particular challenge around clay uh, materials that were causing their plant to, to slow down. So we're able to do a demonstration on that. And essentially what this does is we, we conduct a scan and then through our onboard processes, but essentially we do it predominantly in the cloud, we can then very quickly visualize that in 3D and, and render it so you can actually see um, exactly where, that, where that, um, uh, that, that dig face, or in this particular case, it was a coal mine in the Hunter Valley. And then you could apply these pre-trained algorithms to then very quickly um, determine exactly you know the, the different material content and that's all geo geospatially referenced and you can apply that but then determining whether or not you should be processing more in this particular case the the red zones are very bad yellow, is that, yellow zones not not too bad blue zones basically are, are clay that have no impact on the on the process and then the green zones were, were, were good um so this is another application of of where we use our technology to take a, a this is a, a normal dig face in a in a gold mine, and we're trying to identify very quickly uh, where the zones of of um, of high grade, low grade, and uh, material are in waste. Um, and as you can see, just by looking at it, it's pretty hard. Um, it's, it's essentially impossible to tell um, exactly where the different all grade zones are. The way that this mine currently does it is they do what's known as grade control drilling. So they'll take bulk samples from, from uh, drill cuttings when they're drilling, drilling holes. And from those samples, they'll send that off to the lab. It takes about 48 hours to turn around a sample. It'll give you a gold concentration. They then use that to apply that back to their geological model. And then they update the geological model to improve it from you know, plus or minus 30% uh, of the localised level to plus or minus 15%, but you still get um, quite a degree of localised variation. As you can imagine, there's only so many number of drill holes you can put in, um, in the, into any particular area. So we were able to um, basically very quickly, and this is not real time, of course, but it's showing for just visualisation purposes, do a scan of that scene and then um, apply a whole bunch of techniques to, the, to extract um, the useful information for where those different zones are. Um, this was the colour coding here was done by one of our um, one of our exceptional data scientists who's, who's fantastic at um, being able to solve really complex problems. Communication is not that person's greatest strength. So uh, in this particular colour coding, green is bad, red is good, and purple somewhere in between. Um, but essentially, the idea is that you can identify where those 
good and bad zones are um, quite quite quickly um, and do it without having to have a lot of human intervention or very laborious processes for grade control. If you look, you can't see very well, but essentially if you, if you look really, really closely at this uh, image, there is a very, very faint red line, which is where the, literally the mining technician will come out based on the geological model and have a guess at, or not a guess, but based on the geological model, they'll literally put paint marks on the ground as to where um, the, the transition between zones are. We were able to do this scan independently of them and, and say, hey, actually, we can see generally you're in the right area, but you, you have some transition zones that you're missing out on, which in this particular case is what is cost them about 10% of their ore if they get that in a, in a wrong spot. So it's quite significant for them to be able to get that right and do it quite quickly, um, essentially on every single time they're going to a different pit. Um, the general process is, is that we apply is pretty similar to the way that you know most um, AI machine learning outfits work. We, we collect a whole stack of raw data um, you know, our general philosophy is we collect data on the edge. Um, ideally, we process as much as we possibly can um, in the cloud. Although a lot of the mines that we go to, we don't actually have really good connectivity. So we have to do edge processing as well so that people in the field can get feedback in real time. And so essentially we run a parallel process where collect on the edge, um, process on the edge with pre-trained algorithms but do both, most of our heavy lifting up in a, in a cloud environment. So the idea is we collect, collect data, and this particular scan, you know, it's, we've collected, I think it was just under 20 gigabytes of data. We do that in about five minutes. It's raw, very raw data um, in, um, in the sense that we, we essentially just, um, we, we log um, our scenes in a way that basically allows us to reconstruct any scene that we've ever acquired um, including all the sensor information um, and allows us to re-visualise and replay exactly what's going on. So we collect essentially data as, as, as log files um, and then we have a manifest which is uh, which is our own format but essentially it's like a JSON file that, that instructs how to read those, those raw binary files. Once we have that then we do a whole bunch of pre-processing. There's a huge amount of work that goes into just the pre-processing elements of this type of uh, work. And, and that's because um, you know, there's, a, there's a few challenging factors. One is um, dealing with, you know, open cut mines, you have impacts of the atmosphere. So natural light, which we're using as our light source during the day, travels through the atmosphere, about you know, 15 or so kilometers of atmosphere it travels through. There's lots of water, um, aerosols, other, other uh, materials in the atmosphere, and that absorbs some of the light. So it effectively creates um, blind spots that you can't see through at all because there's no light um, making it to the big face or those particular big areas um, when, when we're doing a scan. So we have to do um, some processing to effectively reverse out the effects of the atmosphere. Um, and some of those, some of that processing is done through using known calibration targets and some of it's done through some uh, radiometric type algorithms. Um, we've developed our technology further than, than anybody else has done it, but it's still an area of active research and development for us. Once we get the pre-processing done, we also, oh, just from an atmospheric point of view, we then have to do other pre-processing around um, how we account for variable illumination of the big face, how we account for uh, variable geometries that we're dealing with um, and the different types of reflective materials that we might be incurring. So a huge amount of work goes into the pre-processing. That's probably the bulk of the work that we do uh, up front and we automate as much of that as we possibly can um, with a view being that you know when we deploy commercially all that that aspect is done completely autonomously. Um, when we get to the processing we then have basically a few different frameworks that we use depending on the use case. Unfortunately we haven't discovered a god algorithm that, that basically um, allows us to just press the process button that gives us exactly what we want. Um, but essentially we have a whole bunch of different frameworks that depending on the mineral commodity and the type of output that we're chasing in terms of whether it's a, 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 an ore grade or whether it's a coarse classification between ore and waste uh, or it's a potentially a deleterious material uh, like clay impacts, we have um, different frameworks that we effectively push data through in order to process that. Some of that's um, semi-autonomous feature extraction, so safe. Um, all the way through to through, through just um, standard uh, classification outputs. 
Um, as a, a worked example, uh, we, as I said, we spend a huge amount of time um, still in, in doing active research. So we've got this, you know, I guess mindset of, of engaging early with clients and getting market traction and making sure that whatever we're doing is having immediate market value. But on the same account, we're, we still spend a huge amount of time um, actively testing different algorithms, different frameworks, different approaches, um, because there is no one size fits all for this. There's lots of different ways that this can be solved. And, and as many of you be familiar, it's a very active um, research area, um, machine learning, deep learning, um, different, different approaches. Um, is something that is, is a real active area and something that we're really excited about as well. So we have a lot of fun with it. But this, this is an example of that same scene where we're basically running it through a uh, convolutional neural network. The previous scene was using some of our more, uh, more of a traditional framework. And this one, we were basically comparing a recent uh, convolutional network that would come out in the, uh, that would be published in 2018. Uh, but we have uh, um, some different, different frameworks that we use, but here's an example of where we've basically said, okay, we want to create an all waste uh, boundary classifier um, based purely on some input labels. So we took some, some solid samples of the dig face, got an idea of the, of the mineral content of those as our training data. So as some of you would see, it's a very sparse set of, uh, of, of training uh, data that we have to, have to work with. Um, so that's, again, another area for us that we're currently working on but push it through a, a, a convolution neural network that was designed by um, uh, Ben and, and others. Um, and we're able to get some really good results with very limited training set and, uh, um, and, and will align quite closely with the work that we've previously done and what the geological data was telling us. And we do have areas of, of, of AI development. Uh, we've got essentially um, three people working on this alone, and we're about to put on some more people in, in, um, in, in the AI space to help uh, build out that and accelerate our, set, our work further. Some of the big challenges that we deal with is around um, dimensionality reduction. So as I mentioned up front, when we collect an image, um, we don't just get RGB data for every pixel in, a, in an image. We, we get essentially 464 channels with our current sensor configuration. Plus we also get LiDAR point cloud data, which we fuse on top of that to give us additional information that we can use for, for, uh, for structure, texture, um, and some other, other really cool things that we're working on. So dimensionality reduction, the cursed dimensionality that many people always talk about is something that's really apparent for us from a commercial application and something that we're always thinking quite deeply about how we, how we can uh, be, be better versed at, at dealing with that and stripping stripping out um, everything back to its, its fundamental elements. You know, traditional techniques like principal component analysis we've used extensively. Um, they actually work quite, quite effectively in certain circumstances, um, but certainly there's areas to go in terms of how we commercialize. Same again for the, for the training data, as I showed in that previous image, you know, we, we're dealing with often very sparse training sets and, and how we work around that is, is somewhat nuanced. Um, feature, feature extraction, using auto encoder, decoder type approaches and some stuff that we're doing. And this is, you know, it looks like a shopping list, but, it, but we're just picking up some points of some of the stuff that fits into our research and development program, which is quite extensive. Um, and just some of the current active things to, I guess, give people an idea that, you know, if you're doing work in AI, maybe you're doing work at university and you want to see whether or not you know, some of the stuff that you're doing in theory is being applied. This is the sort of stuff that we're, we're dealing with on a, on a daily basis. <clears throat> and, you know, as an active work example, um, you can see this bottom plot here. This is an example of, of what we call a spectral signature. Uh, lepidolite, for those familiar with, uh, with battery minerals and spodumene, um, is all related to lithium. So lithium is really important uh, battery mineral. Um, and of course, mining um, the battery minerals in a way that is, is, is efficient and clean and green is, is just as important as using the battery technology itself. It's, it's a little bit uh, inconsistent to uh, you know, develop battery minerals to, to uh, reduce greenhouse gases, but do it in a way that's very destructive and, and not, not helpful to the planet. We're just moving the problem from one space to another. So in this particular case, you get these signatures, lepidolite, spodumene, and what we're doing is trying to 
trying to take literally uh, millions of these signatures and then process them, identify the interesting features um, such as you know these absorption characteristics and trying to tell the difference between this, this lepidolite uh, absorption feature and, the, and a spodumene absorption feature, which in this particular case is, you know, for, for those interested is a aluminium hydroxyl feature, one is weaker than the other. So not only are we using um, in quite advanced techniques in order to resolve that, but we're also making sure that whatever we do is founded in the, in the fundamental physics of the molecular interaction so we can actually understand uh, what we're doing from a repeatability and reliability point of view. Um, so I guess that, that's uh, an overview of the journey that we've been through and a few of the applications that we've been uh, working on uh, here in Brisbane. Really excited about our business. We're, we've got a, a facility here in Bowen Hills, which is, um, allows us to have a workshop laboratory and our office team all in the same place, which is fantastic. Um, we, we, we're building an amazing company. We've got some fantastic backers out of, out of um, Silicon Valley in terms of investors. Uh, we're tackling a really big challenge using AI and sensors and, and working on what we think is a really important opportunity for, for the world. Um, interestingly, I just put this up here because we were in the process of trying to deploy our technology to, to WA, but it got tied up in the border restrictions. So we had a we had a spare afternoon and went down for those familiar with the Breakfast Creek Hotel and did some hyperspectral scanning and uh, were able to just, even though it's not our, our business, core business at all, uh, we could do a scan quite quickly and even tell different um, construction material characteristics um, of, of that building um, using some pretty, pretty rudimentary um, algorithms. And, and interestingly from that, we've been approached by a whole bunch of uh, waste uh, disposal companies and recycling companies that are interested in using this technology to help them at the uh, at the other end of the spectrum, which is you know waste minimization and recycling and recovery, to actually use our technology to help them better understand the materials that they're dealing with, so they can actually be more efficient at that waste end of, of the process as well. So uh, yeah, that's that's it. I think um, Michael, um, if you if you had some facilitated questions, or you'd like me to um, just pick some out, or yeah, Andrew, I, I think we had a few a few questions here from the audience. Um, the first one from Ruben: um, Have you considered how this tech can be adapted to activities like oil sampling, infrastructure inspections, or as an oil and gas pipeline inspection tool? Uh, yeah, so we have. So um, one of the big uh, challenges that we've got to deal with from a business point of view is how how far we spread and, and how focused we remain. Um, so there is applications in oil and gas. One of our competitors um, that works out of out of Canada is called, a company called Enersoft, and they really approach this same opportunity from from an oil and gas point of view. They were using hyperspectral imaging in combination with some other sensors to do uh, scanning of of actual exploration work, but also doing it from from pipeline inspections and the like. Um, there's been some really cool work done by another Canadian company called Telops that actually provide, does long wave uh, infrared sensors, and they're using it for doing things like um, det detecting um, uh, gas leakage. So it's an area that we're, we're super interested in, uh, but you know, we, we're all got about five times more work on at the moment than we can each handle. So we've, we've, it's on a watching brief for us, um, and yeah, it's certainly an area that we see um, as being of, of quite good interest to us as, as we grow and evolve our technology out. But yeah, when you really think about it, there's lots of different ways from a natural resource point of view that you can apply this type of model, this type of approach to be really smart about how you um, understand the, the, the resource or the failure points and how to do things more efficiently. Awesome. Um, that sort of dovetails into a question from Neil. Uh, he asked about um, whether you attempt to protect your research from competitors and whether you use patents, but I think it also uh, leads into a, another question that there's a couple here about data collection and labeled data. Um, do you think that, you know, is, is this something where it's really important to protect your patents or do you think that, you know, the, the difficulty in getting labeled data actually makes it quite challenging for, for just anyone to replicate? 
Um, so, so our our uh, our investors require us to to um, develop an incubator patent protection portfolio or a patent portfolio for for protection. Um, we we've developed some patents already, and we're in the process of doing some additional filings over the next uh, the next uh, essentially couple of months. Um, we we kind of have a decision framework around patents, which you know relates to um, you know, I guess in one element, some trade secrets where, you know, if we can protect something to the point where we know that it's not going to be released and we don't need to take out patent protection, then we, we look at that as an option. We look at then patents as a way of, of protecting a position in the market, um, but also we publish as well. So we've, we've um, published a number of articles um, and some of our technology um, we, we push as much as we can out into the broader community because we think that by sharing as much as we can um, allows general innovation and allows everyone to accelerate. There's, there's gaps in, in, in lots of different areas and if we just try to close all that off for ourselves, um, then we see that as being you know, as big a risk as, as not having any patent protection at all. So we, we, we do patent protect, um, but we do it quite selectively in terms of specific areas around hardware deployments or computer Operations that we see as having a significant value advantage, and if we and if we didn't have that in place, then we felt we really would feel like we've lost, you know, quite a degree of competitiveness. So we 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 do protect, but we we, we as I said, we're quite selective about how we go about doing that. Andrew, you just mentioned um, focusing on devices. A question from Kelvin asking about whether you patent the AI algorithms or the devices. Yeah. So. Patenting uh, AI algorithms is really, really hard. Um, it's and and so we we've avoided that. Um, that said, we we have uh, we are in the process of of um, putting in patents for two very specific um, algorithms that are really important to the way that we do what we do. <coughs> and the reason why we're patenting them is because we feel that if somebody really wanted to dive into that, they could reverse engineer it. Um, and it's something that, um, you know, is really important that, that we see as being a, a potential competitive advantage for us. So we have sought and are continuing to seek in certain circumstances the AI algorithms, but really it's, it's a very small part of our approach because it is difficult to, to, to um, protect those. More importantly, um, you know, for us is, is the data itself and the label data and the training data, which is very expensive and hard to attain. And also um, the devices, you know, there's specific applications of that where we just don't want, don't want people to literally go out and copy exactly what we're doing and then you know, try to undercut our position because that stops us from innovating if, if uh, you know, if we, if we can't continue to, to, to develop the way that we want to develop. So it's easy to do the devices, um, harder to do the algorithms. We generally focus on, on again, those areas where we see as being biggest value, biggest competitive advantage. And if we feel that something is that that you know is of some advantage, but um, also is something that we don't actively want to patent, then we'll generally release that as, as some sort of publication. Uh, we present it at, at um, you know we present at conferences quite regularly. Our technical research, um, Richard Murphy, who's our head of of spectral science, he's you know extraordinarily highly cited researcher. Uh, has a very high research rating on on uh, ResearchGate and, and is probably one of the preeminent people in the world for, for this type of publication. So we don't prohibit that at all. Awesome. Um, we'll do a couple more questions. Um, otherwise, uh, anyone else can sort of stick around uh, and keep asking. But there's one here from Edwin. Um, Edwin says, hello, Andrew. You mentioned that the visualization is not real time. Just wondering how long does it take to process a given area? Yeah. So. It, 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 we call it real. We call it right time in the sense that when we produce an output, our 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 goal, our central goal, is to not be the barrier to a decision. So, um, you know, for the next body of work that we're doing, where we're doing this fitted to an excavator, and we're at, we're effectively working at thirty frames per second. So we're working at video rate, so it's you know proper you know real time in the sense that we've got to be able to deliver a result to say that when a truck is loaded, that that truckload, we know quite accurately what material is on that truck. 
Um, at the moment, because we're informing a daily decision making or, or an area by area decision making, we get a little bit more time, if you like, to process. Um, we've set ourselves some targets. So when we first started this development, it took, um, as I mentioned up front, about three days to process a scan. Our first milestone was to be able to develop a scan, or conduct a scan, process a scan and get a result in a day. We achieved that last, uh, last April. And then our second goal was to be able to complete a scan um, in, in an hour. We achieved that last August. And then our next goal was to be able to complete a scan in 15 minutes, which we completed last. And that includes the processing and visualization uh, last December. And we're now at a point where we can do a scan end to end and produce a result um, and visualize it in 3D with the georeference stuff and the, and the processed output in five minutes. So we've, we've been on a massive decline. We see that as being a big advantage for us, again, compared to some of our competitors who are working in this space, <coughs> who are still going through quite laborious and, and manual processes to get, to get an output. So, um, so yeah, so it's not real time in the sense of, you know, you press a button, you've got an answer, but essentially, um, you know, within five or five minutes end to end scan, process, get a result. Um, and we've got some other targets that we're working to. So essentially, you know, we're trying to get that down to complete processing down to down to 60 seconds is our next goal, which we believe we'll hit in the next next month or so. Um, just on that note, Andrew, just quickly, what has been the key driver? Has it been about hardware? Has it been about better designed algorithms? What, what's been the, the key drivers to that speed up? Uh, yeah, so it's all, all being algorithmic. Um, so we, all of the effort, the, the hardware itself, um, the current hardware stack, LiDAR um, and our, the, the, the sensors themselves basically you know, can publish data really, really quickly. We can log that data, record that data. It's all on the algorithmic side about how you can actually then take that large tranche of data, which might be 20 gigabytes, pre-process it down really quickly into something that, that can then be run through a pre-trained algorithm. So it's, it's almost invariably on the algorithmic side. That said, to go from three days down to one day, it was all on the hardware. So we were integrating hardware, getting the components to talk to each other. <coughs> we use a, you know, we use a, a publisher subscriber type framework, which feeds into a longer term vision for us around automation. But having that framework was the first big milestone to go from taking three days, we have these disparate data sets and you manually fuse them together and build out logs and then process that it was all on the hardware side and how we integrated the hardware and, and now it's now it's all on the algorithms and we may well iterate on that in terms of some different technology or hardware that we're using for the next generation but yeah to get from one day down to down to five minutes has been predominantly algorithms very cool um i've got one question that is slightly less related to the ai and ml side um, in a previous Queensland AI meetup, we actually had some local entrepreneurs come and share their experience trying to raise money in Australia um, and how difficult it is and that the amount of investment that you get from investors here can be an order of magnitude smaller than what you can get in the US. You chose to focus on the US market and raising money over there. Um, for those who are involved or have their own startups locally or might be thinking about it in future um, and you know, maybe thinking about going the same route to raising overseas, what lessons and key pieces of advice do you have for those who are going to focus on those US and global VC funds? Yeah, I, we, we had a position on day one that we we're building a global company. And so, you know, having a very Australia-centric focus from either an investment point of view or a client point of view wasn't aligned with the type of business that we we're trying to build. We wanted a global footprint from day one and we wanted to be able to you know, do that, however, whatever that meant. So for us, the decision to go to North America to seek investors wasn't really a decision. It was, we, we did some, we did some, we were essentially the same decision that we made to even base business here in Brisbane. We made that decision. We said, out of the entire planet, where would we want to base? Where would we want to have a research partner to help us with some of the heavy lifting on the mining field robotics? Um, and that really came to Sydney or Brisbane. Um, you know, it just happens I happen, I happen to be Australian, but but you know, if you've been anywhere in the world, you would probably look at, at either UQ or University of, of Sydney to to build that initial research collaborative partnership. Um, and you know, those companies, those organisations do attract 
people from all over the world to come and work with them on those things. So we took the same approach with with um, VCs, and you know, and you, you don't have to study the market super deeply to work out that. You know, and it's no, not to be disparaging towards the Australian venture capital community. There's lots of really smart people in there and really cool ideas backing some awesome businesses. But on balance, you know, the best VCs in the world are in, are in Silicon Valley. And so we went, well, let's, let's go there. Let's talk to those people. We've got a global business. We have a global idea. Let's go and talk to these people. Who, and we want to attract the best either from a, uh, from a recruitment and talent point of view, from a client point of view. We want to have the best products. So why wouldn't we go after the best investors on day one? And, and interestingly, um, we found that conversation when we, when we went over to North America. Um, you know, there's a lot to learn. I had never, never raised capital before doing it. It was as crude as just door knocking. I ring up somebody and say, hey, will you hear my, hear my pitch? Hear a pitch and that person says, yeah, I'm going to pass. And then you go, that's fine, appreciate that. Do you know anyone who might be interested? And you go and talk to someone else. And over literally every eight weeks, I was flying over there over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of conversations. I managed to start building up a network, building up some relationships. Um, and and um, through that, then got to a point where we could, we could you know, establish our credibility and, and, and get investors. So, um, you know, I think you just need to think about your own company vision and what you're trying to do and, and then align all your decisions based to that vision, whether that's from an investor point of view, a client point of view, or, or, or even a recruitment. Sounds good. Um, I think we will wrap up fairly soon. I think one last question for you, Andrew, one that might be relevant for everyone in the chat. You mentioned earlier that you're looking to uh, expand the team, particularly the data science team and capability. Um, do you want to maybe share, um, you know, what you're looking for, what sort of background of people you're, you're looking to hire, um, what sort of levels you're looking at, and how they can get in touch with you if, if they think they fit the bill? Yeah, um, so we, we, we recruit for character above all else. Um, we kind of have this kind of, kind of kitsch uh, four C's of recruitment, right? So it's nothing to do with the four C's of diamonds, but it's something that I've worked with for a long period of time and have been passionate about um, bringing in people that fit with the culture that you're trying to create. So we always start with a question around character. Do we think this person from a character point of view is aligned with the type of business we're trying to, trying to build? And then there's an element of chemistry, which is, you know, our business is very dynamic. So things are moving all the time, have to be really comfortable dealing with ambiguity. Um, you know, we, we don't have moving goalposts because we don't have goalposts. Everything's quite, quite fluid. And so you've got to get really comfortable with that type of dynamic environment where we are you know, making decisions all the time. Um, you know, we say to all, our, all of our team, leave your ego at the gate. Um, you're going to be wrong 49.9% of the time. Don't ever take it personally, just make a decision, the information you have and move on. So you have to be quite comfortable in that unstructured um, and dynamic environment. We are building more structure as, as, we, as our vision goes from something abstract to something quite concrete. But that, that chemistry of, of the individual to the team um, is really important for us. And then the third bit um, is, is capacity. So we're looking for people more that, you know, um, are able to, to work in, um, in solving problems that have not been solved before or dealing with challenges that haven't been addressed before. <coughs> and so the capacity to learn new things and grow and, and try out new areas is really important. And then lastly, the fourth element is really that confidence element. What skills are you bringing to the table to deliver on day one? And while we rank it fourth, it is also quite important for us because we are still a small business. We still have um, you know, a finite amount of runway. Um, people need to turn up and start delivering on day one. You can't you know, turn up and then say, oh, it's going to take you six months to get up to speed. You've got to be able to find a way to add value to the business as soon as you get here. So they're kind of like the four C's framework that we, that we use. Um, and anybody that feels that they could fit within that, um, I, we've got a guy who's a head of people and culture um, I can I'm sure maybe just put on the chat his email address or something and people just can reach out directly to him. Um, we're looking for people that um, uh, current round of recruiting, we're looking at people at, at different levels. So both at a um, data engineering, um, data science, um, senior, senior data, data science, um, also a software engineering. Um, we're looking at additional capability in that space. Um, and we're even also looking for um, some more geology 
type people that, that understand the spectrogeology uh, aspect. And we're also looking for <coughs> some electro-optical engineers or optical uh, physicists. So, so there, there's a broad scope within, if you think about the business and the vision, all those touch points of people that, that, we're, that we're actively engaging the market with. Um, we don't tend to advertise that much, but you know, we, we um, um, certainly welcome anybody who, who works in AI, has a passion for it, wants to solve really big problems to, to certainly uh, reach out and, and give, um, give, give Greg, a, drop, just drop Greg an email, I'll, I'll drop his email now, and then uh, um, hopefully he'll get bombarded tonight um, with, with lots, of, lots of different requests. He's, He's currently watching the Sydney Swans being thrashed by Collingwood, so he'll be looking forward to some some uh, some emails from you guys. Perfect, good to hear. Um, I think that will do us. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your time and presentation. Um, we will be sharing the recording of the talk. Uh, following, obviously, following the talk, we'll put it up on the Meetup page. We'll also send a message out to everyone. Um, I'll also put a a uh, the I'll put Greg's email um, in that message not publicly but in a private message I will otherwise please be sure to copy it down now before the uh, the talk finishes um, thank you so much Andrew for your time um, guys if you have any other questions or want to reach out to Andrew I'm sure you can on LinkedIn um, other than that we look forward to another event we'll be looking to do another one in a month's time uh, keep an eye on Meetup over the next couple of weeks. We'll hope to have something up soon. Um, thank you, everybody. Have an amazing week and see you soon. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you.